Well, that's not that right. Nice problem to have. <laughs> Excellent. 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 Are there handouts or? There were. <laughs> I think we ran out of
to officially introduce um, Aida Mansour. She was born in London, England. Her parents came from Sri Lanka. Aida has obtained her joint honors BS degree in biochemistry and physiology at King's College at the University of London. She has a master's degree in community health and is currently pursuing a master's in Christian Muslim relations from the Hartford Seminary. She received her Islamic chaplaincy certificate in 2012 and has been presenting about Islam since 1999 at various settings, thankfully including ours. She is a board member of the Connecticut Council for Interreligious Understanding, Hartford Hospital and St. Francis Hospital Pastoral Service Committee, the Islamic Association of Greater Hartford, and has been awarded the Human Relations Award from the National Conference for Community and Justice in 2011. Aida has been a board member since 2009 and president, she's the immediate past president, of the Muslim Coalition of Connecticut. Um, she served there from 2011 to 2016. Committed to building bridges through various outreach efforts. She is married and has two children, Yasmin and Yosef. I also want to thank, by the way, in addition to building bridges here with our congregation, our synagogue, I'm also honored to welcome members from, at the very least, I know we have representatives from the First Congregational Church of Westbrook here tonight. Um, as well as uh, the Congregational Church of Chester, including their spiritual leader, Reverend Lee Ireland. So we're glad you're with us tonight. Um, thank you for coming and seeing the importance of our talk this evening. So thank you, Mrs. Mansour. Welcome. <coughs> Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So. Okay. okay. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay. So um, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for inviting me to this glorious setting. Chester is a beautiful place, right? There's a lovely drive. Uh, we live in Berlin, so it's a great drive coming here. Okay, so I'm going to just jump into my, my, my PowerPoint. Um, and I really, if you have any questions, please you know, keep them in mind. There's no such thing as a bad question, okay? So uh, please hold on to them till the end, um, and I'll try and speak as fast as I can. Okay, all right, so I'm never sure what speed this is gonna go at because my kids have access to my laptop, so <laughs> I can't play with them yet. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Islam, obviously. All right, in order to do that, I'm gonna start off by um, a usual question that I get asked a lot. And that is, what is the connection between Islam and Muslim? And to answer that question, um, you guys should know Islam. This is the, the answer to this question. Can, can any of you tell me what the Hebrew word is for peace? Shalom. 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 Right, excellent. Now, um, Hebrew is a Semitic language, and so is Arabic. Does anybody know the Arabic word for peace? Oh, you guys know all the answers. I don't know. Yeah. All right, so Sanaa, I'm going to give you a brief Arabic 101. Uh, grammar course, it takes five seconds. Um, every word in the Arabic language has a two or three letter root. So if you have this word salam and you take out the vowels, the A's, you have a seen, a lamb, and a meme, a sa, a la, and a ma sound. And if you look at the word Islam and Muslim, they have those letters in that order. So if you were to look, uh, if you were look, to look for the word Islam or Muslim in an Arabic dictionary, you would look up the word Salam. Okay. Um, and lots of times, people when they're being interviewed, they uh, Muslims will say Islam means peace. What they actually mean is the root of the word Islam and Muslim is Salam, which is peace. And for a technical um, definition, the Arabic word Islam simply means submission. Submission to the will of God so that one can attain peace. Okay, so that's where the peace comes from. And this is actually, uh, we read from right to left, very similar to Hebrew, um, and it says Islam right there. Okay? Now, um, I'm just going to quickly ask the question um, Have any of you been on a safari lately? Anyone? No? Oh, where did you go? The real thing. 
Okay, lots of times I ask people, did you go to the Ngorongoro Crater? Yeah? Oh, I can see someone nodding. Because usually when I ask that question, we have to Okay, so not the real thing. Usually when I ask that question, people say, does Disney count? <laughs> okay, so the reason I'm asking you the word safari is safari is an Arabic word. And it means to travel. Safar is to travel. And a traveler is called a mu'safar. So you add a mu at the beginning of the word, and you get the doer of the word. Now you have this word Islam. If you want the doer of the word, you add a mu at the beginning, and what do you get? Muslim, very good. Okay, so a Muslim is someone who follows the way of Islam, that is someone who submits to the will of God so that one can attain peace. So Islam isn't really named after anyone. It's more of a concept, submitting to God's will so that one can attain peace. Okay, and it could include all of us, if you think about it. We all submit to God's will to attain peace. Okay. Uh, I thought I'd start off by you know, a few sensitivities. Um, Greeting someone who is a Muslim, um, there sometimes can be a sensitivity when it comes to shaking hands, um, especially if it's um, people of different genders. So if a, a woman is greeting a man, or a man is greeting a woman, sometimes shaking hands can be an issue. Uh, and I remember one, uh, sort of a few years ago living in West Hartford, and uh, our neighbor was uh, an Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, individual, and he, when my daughter went out to, to shake her, her hand, she, she should have known better, um, he says, no, no, I don't shake hands. And it's very similar to, you know, a lot of Muslims who also will not shake hands for the same reasons. Um, uh, and, and so what, what, what usually actually is very interesting, uh, one time one of my friends, uh, she was being um, interviewed by Channel 3. And she had decided when she became Muslim that she wasn't going to shake hands. This was her decision. Uh, and so she went into the studio and I think it was Alta who came up to her and said, oh, it's very nice to meet you. Good. Uh, you know, her hand up, she said, no, no, I don't shake hands. And he did this, he said, can I borrow your shoulders for a second? He said, okay then. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, maybe I should have shook your hands. <laughs> okay, so, you, uh, so recently, well, a few years ago, I was invited to uh, my cousin's wedding. And he was someone who had been in the diplomatic service for a number of years, and had lived in Egypt also for a number of years. And when they got married, um, you know, after they got married, we were all in line greeting the new couple, and he hugged and he kissed every single woman, and then he came to me. And he looked at the way I was dressed, and he, he thought, maybe, you know, it could be an issue. And what he did was he put his hand on his heart and he bowed his head. Mm -hmm. And that's such a beautiful way to greet somebody. So if, if ever you're, you're sort of in the situation where someone doesn't put their hand straight out, that means that shaking hands can be an issue, and the best way to do that is just put your hand on your he uh, heart and tie your head. Okay, so it's very respectful and no touching is required. Okay? Uh, there are uh, you know, many, many Muslims, and I'll go through the numbers in a bit, but there are many, many Muslims. Some people you know, see it as an issue and some people don't. So always be led by the person you're greeting. Okay? And the greeting is Assalamu Alaikum, which means may God's peace be with you. Very similar to Shalom Alaikum. Okay? Very, very all right, and this is just a picture of people hugging and kissing. If it's the same gender, usually it's not an issue. Of course, you know, people's personal space and everybody is different. But generally speaking, women will hug women uh, and men will hug men. Uh, and there's no real issue, usually. Uh, does anyone recognize this gentleman? This is actually Justin Trudeau, and he's actually showing how to grieve by putting your hand on your, your heart and bowing. And I think he's, he's greeting a few uh, refugees who have just come from Syria. So that's the example. Okay. Now this is my least favorite slide, you can probably tell why. Um, there was a study done before 9-11, it was a Yale study, where they actually called a number of people around the country and the first question they asked was, do you know a Muslim personally? And if the answer was yes, they weren't included in the study because this was about perception. Okay. If they answered no, the next question was, what words come to mind when you hear the word Islam or when you hear the word Muslim? Okay. And so this horrible list was generated as a result of that. So the public perception is that Muslims are terrorists, they're violent, <coughs> they're fanatical, or about women, that women are oppressed, they're submissive, they're, un they're uneducated and they cannot work, that they're foreign, 
that they don't speak English, I don't know why they sued that one. Because <laughs> um, they're not our friends, but undemocratic, they're intolerant and they're backward. Horrible list, right? Now, if, they don't, if people haven't really met any Muslims personally, where would they get these perceptions from? Anyone? Parents. Parents, okay. Yeah, parents. Yeah. Okay, I think, yeah, I think you're, you're all right. <laughs> but mainly the media. Okay? Yeah. The media has, uh, you know, sort of, there's lots of, there was actually an article done a few years ago, recently, where they actually looked at how many stories were positive and how many were negative. And when they covered Islam, but it was it was skyrocketing in terms of negative stories. And I have to say, you know, when we do anything positive and we call the press, um, they usually aren't so interested. And I, I remember once doing a, a um, we, were, we were on a habitat build, and the rabbi said to me, you know, they probably would come if I were to hit you, or you would hit me. Uh, and that's the issue. You know, something that's Peace generating is not newsworthy, and that's mm -hmm. one of our issues. Mm -hmm. um, and an example of the media, um, in 2002, there was, um, does any, everybody men, uh, remember the Washington Cycle? Yeah. Uh, so in 2002, there was this guy, who doesn't know about him, um, and he was driving around DC, he had drilled a hole in the back of his car, put a gun out, and he was basically shooting people in this moment, in, you know, very indiscriminate. Yeah. And it, it was, you know, he had shot one person in, you know, outside Joanne Fabric, he, he shot another person in the gas station. And I remember wanting to go to DC and then deciding maybe I'll go to Pavia because he was really, you know, sort of, it was a very scary time. And then I remember he was caught. And then in 2006, he was sentenced. He was actually sentenced to death. And I remember the headline in the newspaper. It said, does anyone remember his name? Uh, his name was John Muhammad. So it said, John Muhammad, comma, recent convert to Islam, comma, mm. and then all the horrible things he had done. Mm. And as I was reading that, I felt, you know, what has his religion got to do with what he did? What made the point more, you know, sort of even more strong was in that same newspaper, there was another Muhammad who had just won the Nobel Peace Prize, mm. and nothing about his faith was mentioned. Mm. So there is a bias, okay? And so I'd like to invite everybody to, of course, uh, you know, watch the news, okay? That's fine. But also see, you know, what does BBC World say? What does Al Jazeera say? And we you know, compare, you know, what different news outlets are saying about the same story. Because there, there's, you know, there is a bias, definitely. Uh, Hollywood is another source of perception. There are a number of movies where the bad guy is usually a Muslim, an Arab, uh, or both. Okay, I remember this, you probably know how old I am when I tell you this, but when I was growing up, the bad guy was always Russian. <laughs> and before that, the bad guy was usually African American. Before that, the bad guy was Native American. And it's a shame that we have to choose a group to love to hate. Um, I have a friend whose brother-in-law is an actor, and he and his he is Arab, and he cannot get a job unless he's cast as a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And now they're, they're, they're kind of, not, you know, they don't have enough actors who have all of this like this. And so they're asking Latinos and, you know, can you just shout, you know, sort of some Arabic words. And, you know, they're trying to, it's, it's, it's really quite sad, actually. Um, an example of a Hollywood film uh, that all of you probably know, uh, my kids love the film as well, uh, is Aladdin, Disney's Aladdin. Um, it's a great film. It's, you know, Robin Williams is the genie. It's, you know, very colorful. But if you were to look at it with a critical eye and listen to what's being said, uh, it can be a little uh, problematic. Um, for one thing, Aladdin could be from Connecticut. Okay, the way, apart from the baggy pants and stuff, the way he talks, his mannerisms, etc., are very, you know, Connecticut. Uh, whereas Jafar is foreign. And it's interesting, a couple of years ago, they actually did a, you know, they actually uh, talked about how they based Aladdin's face off Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. And it'd be interesting to see who they based Jafar's face, the evil guy in Jafar. But they didn't get that far. But it's just interesting to think about that. Mm -hmm. But that's an example of a Hollywood movie. Um, cultural practices of some Muslims. There are some things that Muslims do that are not Islamic, uh, and, they, and they're cultural. And an example of that is female genital mutilation, for instance. This is done in certain countries. If you go to Guinea, for instance, or Somalia, um, Muslims in those countries have this practice. Christians in, this, uh, in these countries have this practice. 
tribal people in these countries have this practice. It's a cultural practice. I have to say, I had never heard of F um, FGM until I came, you know, and watched the news. Um, so it was, it was very new to me. I'd never heard of it. So it's a, it's a very cultural practice. And in this one, we're told that if you if you harm the body in any way, um, it's it, it's it's not it's not right. Even a tattoo, for instance. It's seen, it is seen as not, you know, not allowed by a lot of Muslims because they don't want to play with the body, okay? Um, so that's an example of cultural practices. I'll give you an, a very tame example, I think. Um, when I uh, came to Connecticut, um, I remember going uh, to the mosque and they, you know, I was introduced and I said, you know, my name is Ida Mansour and they said, oh, your father is Mansour? And I said, no, no, I said, no, no, my husband is Mansour. And they said, you changed your name? And I said, yeah, and, and I didn't realize, but it's not a really, it's not an Islamic practice for a woman to change her name. Uh, the Islamic practice is for her to keep her identity, and to, yeah, and, and so me being, being brought up in the West, I had no idea. No. Another example, um, you know, originally we come from Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka has 7% Muslims. Um, the majority are Buddhists. Then the next uh, big population are Hindu, and then there are 7% Muslims and 7% Christians in Sri Lanka. And the Sri Lankan uh, Muslims uh, you know, have certain practices, and one of those practices is a dowry system. Actually, it's, it's now, you know, people are doing it less, but um, if, if you have a daughter and you want to go to the bride room for your daughter, uh, you know, people will take out loans, they'll mortgage their homes in order to get a good husband for their daughter, and they'll pay you know, money for a deposit for a home, for the, you know, for the new bridegroom, etc., etc. Fortunately for me, my husband was aware that um, it wasn't an Islamic practice, and, it, and the Islamic practice is that, that the wife is given a gift. So it was great. So that was a win-win for me. <laughs> um, so that's another uh, sort of example where cultural practices and religious practices are actually in conflict with one another. Okay. Um, the Islamophobia Network is another source of perception. There's a very good uh, document called Fear Inc., if anybody's interested in this, uh, where they actually trace back the funding for people who spread misinformation about Islam. And there are many, I mean, it's, it's actually a very small group, but they've amassed you know, around $42 million, and basically the, the, they kind of spread the, you know, sort of, um, a lot of a lot of misconceptions. For instance, one of them uh, said that um, uh, that Muslims believe in a moon god. Never heard of that at all. I've never heard of that. But if you don't know a Muslim person, or you don't or you don't know anything about Islam, you're more likely to believe in this information. Um, so that's an interesting you know sort of thing to look into if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, hate rhetoric by certain groups. There are certain groups that hate Muslims. One example of a, a hate group that hates a lot of people actually. Um, is the KKK, uh, the Kukuk Klan. And I just want to show you this, which is very interesting. This is actually on my Facebook page. Of, I mean, I, I saw it on, on Facebook a few, a few months ago. It says the KKK wants you, and then it says, help us fight the spread of Islam in our country to join on their hotline and website. I didn't realize this. But just imagine they're using that as a way of people you know, to entice people to join the KKK, uh, which is very, very, very scary. Um, if you think about it. Recently, in, in, in December, there was a poll that was done where people were asked, would they consider bombing our brother? Okay? And around 30% of people <coughs> said they would. Um, but does anybody know about <laughs> No? It, it doesn't exist. Thank you. It's actually a fictional city in Aladdin. <laughs> and the, the, the sort of, it's very interesting. That, I mean, it's beautiful. It kind of looks beautiful. But you call them thing. Um, the interesting thing was, I mean, fr from the study, they, they, the, the, the point was that they, they said people will, will consider bombing a place if it has an Arabic name. Mm. Um, my issue is I have an Arabic name, my kids have Arabic names, uh, and so, you know, that, that is problematic. Um, mm. If we go back in time in terms of looking at spin, uh, I, I was homeschooling my daughter for a number of years, and we did a, a whole course on British literature. And one of the things we, we covered was the Song of Roland, uh, which was originally written in French. Uh, it's an epic <coughs> poem uh, where it talks about how this great guy Roland is um, you know, sort of killed by the Muslims. Okay? 
And I was reading it, and it was quite, you know, sort of very, very, very sad, and, you know, how he's a God-fearing man who is killed by Muslims. And then, you know, I, I went to the introduction where they talk about the actual story, and it said that Roland was, wasn't killed by Muslims at all. He was killed by the Basque in, in, in Spain. And so this is like an early example of spin. Uh, in 1099 coming up, so a few years ago, uh, and it basically was to get people to join the crusade uh, against those Muslims over there. Uh, so this is just an example of spin. And I, did, I wasn't aware of it until I taught my the, the class that I'm doing a This is a problem. 62% of Americans have never met a Muslim. So that means that 62% of people are more likely to have those problems that we've had earlier. And that's one of the reasons we do what we do, is to try and work on that number and bring it down. Um, so people, once people have a, have a, have a, um, a personal connection with a Muslim, uh, all those perceptions go up a little uh, But the issue is that 62% haven't got that connection. So we're working on it. Uh, this is a book by Jack Shaheen, where it reviews over 100 movies. Uh, finding that Arabs and Muslims continue to be portrayed as terrorists. This is an example of, um, you know, sort of uh, film and, and how it covers Islam and Muslims. I love questions. Can anybody tell me how many Muslims there are in the world? One million. Okay, very good. Okay, so okay. Getting better. Yes. Okay, so there are there are 6.8 billion humans on Earth, and out of that, there are 1.7 billion. So it's one in four of the global population. Okay. And if you were to have those perceptions that people do, uh, and you're one of the 15%, that would be a very scary slide to look at, right? All right, so another question. Are most Muslims Arab? Excellent, yes. Do you know what the percentage is? Anybody? <laughs> it's actually, I'll, I'll just tell you, 82% are not, 18% are, okay? Before I started wearing my headscarf, people would automatically assume I was a Latina. Uh, and then I, I remember one time being in, the, in, in, in a line in the post office and somebody talking before I wrote my stuff. Someone talked to me in Spanish and I said, I mean, I don't know Spanish, I'm really sorry. And he was really upset. He said, you turned your back on your whole culture. <laughs> and then of course I had to explain that I was born in England and he said, oh, okay, I'm so sorry. And then, you know, it, was, it was a nice conversation after that. Um, but then after I wrote my head stuff, the first question that I used to get is, oh, you speak English. Where did you learn to speak English? And it's amazing how a small piece of cloth can make such a difference in terms of how people see one another, right? Um, but the fact is that 18% are Arab and 82% are not Arab in the Muslim population. Okay? So if they're not all Arabs, where do Muslims come from? Okay, I heard someone say Indonesia. Actually, Indonesia is the country that has the most number of Muslims. But if you look at the, the logistics, and uh, I mean, if you look at the demographics here, um, around 400 to 450 million uh, are from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. There are around 400 million from Africa, and there are usually the countries North Africa. Uh, so it would include countries like um, uh, Algeria, okay, uh, Tunisia, uh, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, all those northern countries, Nigeria, okay, those countries uh, North of Africa, okay, or, or North Africa. 280 million account for Arab countries. Southeast Asia, which includes uh, Indonesia, accounts for 250 million. China has 130 million. If I were told to tell you, close your eyes and think of a Muslim, how many of you would have thought of someone in China? <laughs> I know I wouldn't have until I did some until I did the research. Okay, um, 65 million come from Iran. Uh, 65 million from Turkey. 50 million from Central Asia, from those countries that used to belong to the USSR. I call them the Psalms, like Tajik, uh, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, all those Psalms. Um, 20 million come from Europe, 7 million come from North America, 3 million come from South America, and 1 million come from Australia. Okay. And if we look at uh, America, um, it's very, very diverse. Around a third of American Muslims are African American, around a third um, are uh, immigrants from from South, Asia, from South Asia, and the rest of the third are, are Arabs, Africans, Southeast Asians, Europeans, and others, okay? So it's very, very diverse. I remember the first time I ever went to a mosque, the leader of the prayer was Egyptian. To the right of me, there was someone, someone from Bosnia. To the left, someone from Somalia. In front of me, there was a Pakistani behind me. It was amazing to see how diverse we are. Um, if you ever go to a mosque in, in, um, in America, it's very, very diverse. 
Um, if you were to go to a mosque in Sri Lanka, it's very boring. They're just, they're just you know, Sri Lankan Muslims, that's it. But here, it's very, very diverse. Okay. Um, this is a, this a study um, from 2009, a Gallup, a Gallup study, where they actually looked at the populations and they found it to be a very diverse population. So that's a, that's a good study that I think really wants to do that. Uh, and this graphic was made uh, as part of the study where they look, they show the ethnic breakdown uh, for the different faiths. Um, so you can see how it looks. It's very, very diverse in terms of Hispanic and Asian and, and African American population as well. Um, this is a slide that's basically talking about the education standards of Af American Muslims. And it says here 67% of American Muslims have a bachelor's degree or, or higher. So it's quite a you know, well-educated population. Uh, this is an important slide. Not everything a Muslim does is based on religion. Okay, important to know. Culture is also another strong influence, and it may be different from or even contrary to religion, as I stated before. And of course, not every the, a Muslim is religious. Okay, something important to note. I know when I'm outside in the parking lot, for instance, people will look at me, and I'm really aware that they'll be thinking, "Oh my gosh, this is a Muslim." So I, as a result of that, I'm very well behaved. I, you know, when I go to stop and shop, I always put my cart away. You know, if I didn't, if I didn't have the best stuff, I probably leave the cart in the street. But, uh, but because I have this, I think, oh my gosh, they're going to judge the whole 1.7 billion of us. <laughs> and so I'm on my best behavior. This is a thing that I'm worried about. All right. So as Muslims, we have um, two Islamic sources. Of course, the most important source is the Quran. Uh, it's the word of God, we believe, uh, revealed to Angel Gabriel. That's the same Angel Gabriel that came to a lot of prophets and, and gave them the message. Okay? Uh, today, the word remains unchanged. That's 1,400 years later, still in its original language, which is Arabic, and it was revealed over a period of 23 years. Okay? The other source of the hadith, which are the words and traditions of the prophet Muhammad, is the Quran. And the reason why they're both important is, of course, the Quran is, is the word of God, we believe. And so uh, it will say something like, we need to pray. Okay? How do we pray? For that, we will go to the Hadith and see how the Prophet did it. Okay? So that's why they're both pretty important. Okay? Uh, and this is a, a page of the Quran. This is actually a very, very you know, sort of, uh, ornate uh, page of the Quran. And it's actually from the British Museum where you have all these gold and kind of stuff. Nowadays, of course, we have a script like this. Um, you can see the top here, it says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, which means in the name of the one God, the most gracious, the most merciful. A lot of times, you know, when I'm invited to bar mitzvahs and stuff, and I, and I, and I attend uh, services in a in synagogue, I can hear, you know, there's a lot of words that are so familiar to me. Uh, like, for instance, Rahman, which means, uh, which means most merciful. It's very similar, Raham is very similar in Hebrew as well. Right? Um, so there's a lot of similarities. And this is one of my favorite uh, verses in the Quran. It says, uh, oh, you, so in the name of the one God, the most gracious, the most merciful, O oh, mankind, we created you from a single soul, male and female, and made you into nations and tribes so that you may come to know one another. Two of the most honored of you in God's sight is the greatest of your piety, for God is all known. And why do we have different amounts of melody on our skin? Simply that we should rejoice in our diversity and get to know one another. That's the purpose. And I remember, I don't know if you've, you've seen the film Malcolm X, have you seen the film Malcolm X? Where actually, if it's a great film, if you haven't seen it, please, you know, you should see it. Uh, he talks about how, um, when he started off his life as part of the nation of Islam, and then he went for the Hajj, which is the pilgrimage, and he realized that color wasn't an issue. Before, uh, as, a, as a member of the nation of Islam, he had you know, been taught that the white man was the devil. And then when he went for the Hajj, he had to share a room with this you know, blonde haired guy with blue eyes. And he realized color wasn't the issue um, because God sees us as equal in the eyes and all equal in the eyes of God. Um, so this is one thing that reminds me of that. I'll just share with you a few uh, hadith or traditions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Uh, first one, the world is green and beautiful and God has appointed you his stewards to work mm -hmm. it. Okay. Uh, the next one, modesty and faith are closely joined together and if one is lost, the other goes as well. Uh, and this, part, this last one, which I put to my husband daily, or I should, uh, it says here, the most perfect of you in faith is the best in morality and the best of you is the one who is best in his 
And the answer that I have for you is that we are in charge of that. Only God knows who is going to go to heaven and who isn't, because only God can see into our hearts um, exactly what our motivation is and why we do things. So that's basically um, you know, sort of what we believe in terms of life after death. Uh, we also believe that the power to do good or bad is from God, yet God, yet God gives us the choice. So that is free will, but there's also an immense power that God has. And so um, a lot of people say, well, why do you know, bad things happen to good people? And the Muslim will, will say, well, you know, we don't know that. God is in charge of everything. He is in control, um, and we leave it to God. But it may be a, a way of getting us to do more things, you know, better things to help others, maybe. Um, so that's how we look at you know, these challenges. And you know, our life is supposed to be filled with challenges, and we're supposed to do the best that we can. And it's a test. Um, that's, that's how we do that. Uh, what's the time? Let me just check. Sorry about this. Oh. Okay, so let me talk about the pillars of faith, which are, which are our worship practices. If anybody, I can see people taking notes. If anybody would like a copy of my presentation, you're very welcome. Just email me and I'll send you a copy. Okay, if anybody would like that. Okay, so in terms of worship practices, the first one, the most important one, is bearing witness that there is one God. And the reason why it's so important is when Islam came down to the Arabian Peninsula, it was at a time when people worship many gods. So the concept of one god to many people in Arabia was you know, a little forest. There were Jews and Christians in the area, but the majority believed in many, many gods. Okay? Um, prayer is another worship practice. Charity, another one. Fasting, another one. And pilgrimage. And what I'll do is I'll talk up to prayer, and then we'll take my five minute, uh, five minute break for me to pray, and then we'll continue. Okay? So bearing witness that there is one God, and Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, is called the Shahada. When someone becomes a Muslim, they state the Shahada. When someone is close to death, they are encouraged to recite the Shahada because it's reaffirming that faith. Okay. Uh, now, so far I've been using the word God a lot. Uh, what's the other term that Muslims may use? Allah. Very good. Okay. And if you look at the Semitic roots, um, if you look at the word Allah, from uh, Shkid Al-Rahim, uh, in Arabic it's Allah, in Arabic uh, it's Allah. You can see there is a connection. I remember being given a beautiful Bible um, uh, in Arabic. And from the first line of Genesis right through, you can see the word Allah right through. Uh, because it means the one God. Okay, it's just the Arabic word for the one God. It's not the Muslim God. And the reason I'm going on about it so much is because I remember one time, I think it was my college, it was a few years ago, Mike Wallace was interviewing uh, an Iranian diplomat and he said, does your God Allah think, you know, what do you think your God Allah will think? And I think to a lot of people who are Christian or Jewish who were speaking Arabic would feel, that's, that's, you know, that's not appropriate because it, it just means the one God. Okay? And the reason why Muslims like to use the term is it cannot be pluralized and it isn't gendered. Okay? So you know like how the word God is definitely masculine because there's Godess, which is feminine and you can have goddesses and gods, you can't do that word uh, with the word Allah, because it means the one God. And of course we believe, I mean, we say he, because English is somewhat, you know, we don't, if I were to you know, refer to God as it, it wouldn't seem, you know, sort of respectful. So we say he, but as Muslims we know that God is above gender. He created gender. So he's not feminine, he's not masculine, it's just a problem with the English language in terms of how we refer to God because we can take it in the uh, And so if you were a Christian or if you were Jewish and you were to speak Arabic, you would refer to God as Allah. Okay, it's just the Arabic word. Okay, that's all. All right, um, in terms of prayer, has anybody seen uh, someone praying uh, with Muslim by any chance? Yes? Would you like to just Talk a little bit about what you saw. Well, the position is very different than other religions. Okay. Position as in how you stand? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. We have a Okay, excellent. Okay. Just kneeling down. Kneeling down. Okay, excellent. Heading toward Mecca. Excellent. Okay, usually people will say towards the east and they'll say, well, what if you lived in? You know, New Zealand, you know, with the younger So yes, I think we got a lot of what I was going to ask. So, um, 
We pray five times each day, okay? Uh, we pray on a specific, uh, just here on a prayer mat or specific clean area. I actually brought a few of my uh, sort of prayers from home. This is actually a, a travel one. Um, it's actually waterproof, so you can actually, you know, sort of pray on wet grass. It's pretty good. Uh, and, it, and, and it folds into a small, teeny, teeny, tiny space. You can keep it in your bag, which is very good. Um, then I have this one, which is... My daughter, which was four, she thought this was hers because of the size. Um, but it's actually a travel prayer. Uh, and the point of it is so that you can put your head down uh, on a clean space when you, when you pray. Okay? And this one, which is my... Um, this is one that we use at home uh, with the whole family. I remember the first time I took this one out, I was actually in a kindergarten class. And all the kindergartners in unison said, Aladdin. And I said, and they all expected to fly around the classroom with their name. And I said, no, this does not work. And they, and they all in unison went, oh. <laughs> but all it does is create a clean space. Okay, so that's, I don't know, that's time, it's really. But it, all it does is create a clean space. Many times if you were to go to a Muslim home, uh, a lot of times people will say, please remove your shoes before you enter the home. And the reason for that is because they want their whole home to be a place uh, and I know well, that, that, that's also the reason why uh, people remove their shoes before they go inside a mosque. And the reason why we remove our shoes before we pray is in the tradition of Moses. When Moses was about to speak to his Lord, uh, God instructed him to remove his shoes before he prayed. And so we do that in the, in the tradition of Moses. Okay, um, okay so that's the prayer of we usually wash before we pray. Um, there's a specific way we wash. We wash our hands three times, our nose and mouth three times, our face three times, our right arm three times, our left arm three times, our forehead and our, and our ears, and then our right foot and our left foot. And if any of you have colleagues who, who uh, you, know, you walk into the restroom and they have their foot in the sink, it may be the reason that they're very, very, you know, very innocent reason that they're washing their feet before they pray. Okay. Um, so that's the wash. Uh, at Friday prayer is a very important time. It's the equivalent in terms of importance, uh, equivalent to the Sabbath. Um, so uh, on a Friday lunchtime, if you have colleagues who disappear at lunchtime or have an extended lunch break or have a half day that day, it's because they're going to the community prayer, which is Friday lunchtime, uh, which is the equivalent of the Sunday service for the Christian or the, or the Shabbat service if you um, are the Jewish. Okay. Uh, and finally, we pray, as, as you said, in a specific direction. Um, my husband will come to a place and he'll say, oh, the sun rises here. Of course, we know the sun rises in the east. Okay, and um, so we pray northeast. Okay, and the reason we pray northeast is because we use the pole. We go directly to Mecca and so that's the shortest way to go. Okay, so we pray northeast. Um, so he will use the sun because the sun rises in the east, but I have this really Really, and I don't need to tell anybody, but there's a really special way of doing it, and it's called a compass. <laughs> okay, so how people will use a compass? Nowadays, people uh, will have, oh, I don't know how to pitch it, but uh, a lot of people have apps also. Um, a lot of apps in terms of what the direction is in which to pray, um, and people will use that. Um, so that's very useful. Uh, this is a slide showing people praying, and people pray everywhere. Uh, I actually saw a picture of someone actually in New York City praying on his yellow cab, which is very interesting. Um, so you, basically, the world is, is there for, you know, as a place of prayer. Uh, and so long as we put a clean area to put our heads down, um, people will, will pray in, 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 in any place. Parks and stores. Uh, if some people actually say it is time to pray. And that in the mall, for instance, a lot of women will say, you know, we'll take try on some clothes, but also pray in the, in the changing rooms as well. So that's, that's a place that sometimes people will pray if they haven't got a space designated. Um, so you know, people will, will, you know, sort of will be very inventive, I think. Uh, in terms of place to pray, uh, people pray in a mosque. Uh, this is the Berlin Mosque. Uh, this mosque, I think, is in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Uh, yes? Okay. So you come and speak there. Yeah, okay. Uh, and this one, actually, uh, again, you're very welcome to, if you would like to come to the mosque and have a tour. Berlin, Just, Connecticut. Berlin, in Berlin, in, not in Berlin, Germany. Yeah. So Berlin, Connecticut, yes. Oh. Uh, I don't tell my husband this, but I actually have a key. If anybody would like to go in and have a look, you know. Uh, so if anybody would like to do that, please give me a call and you know, we can have a tour. There are open houses that happen a few times a year. So if anybody would be interested in doing that, 
keep that video. Uh, now, I think what's, what's the time now? We have a five minute break now, if that's okay with everybody. Um, and then we'll, 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 we'll sort of uh, recommence. Is that okay with everybody? And I'll just say my best. I'll take five minutes for talks. All right, thank you so much.
How are you, Sue? Like this, this presentation is from 7 to 9, and the window of opportunity was from 7.14 to 8.33. So I would have missed it if we had uh, extended the time. So I apologize, but thank you so much for being so patient with us. Um, so if you were to look at the 7th of September, which is today, okay, dawn was at 3 minutes past 5. So many Muslims will get up at around 5 o'clock, wash, and get ready for the prayer. Okay, um, and the, the second column it says um, 6:22. That's when the sun rises. So we have to do it before the sun rises. If we wake up at 6:30, we've lost the window of opportunity. So we have to kind of make it up, which is not really an issue, but it's so nice when it's on time. Uh, I have to say, when my when I pray my prayers on time, my day is a good day. Uh, and I, if I miss it, I think, oh, man, you know. Um, so it's always a good thing to try and do it on time. The earlier, the better. Um, the second prayer is then from 12.48 to 4.25, okay? The Asr or afternoon prayer is from 4.25 to 7.14, which is the time of sunset. And then the sunset, the prayer of sunset is from 7.14 to 8.33, which we just did just now. And then the nighttime prayer is at 8.33, but we can do it any time after that. So we can do it at you know, 11 o'clock at night if we wanted to, okay? Um, so that's basically the prayer schedule, and as you see by, you know, if you look at the sheet of paper, the times change every day. So a prayer schedule is vital uh, if you live uh, away from the equator. Those people in, in Sri Lanka have no problems. They have their sunset always at 6.30, you know, everything is set. But as you get away from the, the equator, things get a little, you know, uh, and then especially if you go more north than what we are, it's, it's even it's more challenging. Um, so it's all south for that matter. Uh, it's, it can be challenging. 
Uh, I'd also like to refer you to uh, the last column, which are the Islamic dates, okay? Um, and that means it's a, we go by a lunar calendar. Uh, if you look at the 3rd of September, okay, that was when we could see, or we could try and see a new moon, okay? We go strictly by the lunar calendar. Um, it's very different. I mean, I know in, in the Jewish um, custom, it, it is a, that you have the, the lunar calendar, but then you readjust so that it's within the cultural, uh, the, the agricultural seasons, right? In terms of when. So that's what Hanukkah is always done in December time. For us, we lose 10 solar days each year. And so in 31 years, we'll be back to having this, this time at this time. Okay? In 15 years' time, uh, we'll be having, so at the moment, we're having Ramadan in summer. In 15 years' time, we'll have Ramadan in, in, in December. Um, so we, we lose 10 solar days each year, okay? Um, so if you think about the new moon uh, was on, on the 3rd of um, September, it was Burkija, which is the month of Hajj. If you were to watch the news, uh, people actually going on that pilgrimage uh, around this time. Um, so it's a, these, actually these 10 days are one of the most important times. I really do want to miss my prayer today. Um, so that's another reason, uh, you know, sort of in terms of prayer. Um, what else did I want to say about this? So this is basically um, the schedule, and we have a, a, a new sheet of paper every month um, so that we know what times to pray. Um, the other thing is, in terms of, I mean, in terms of apps, uh, you, we have a lot of apps that so we just have to put our zip code in, and then it all fits into place, and we can find our own... Um, you know, sort of schedule that way. Um, that's another way of doing it. All right. Um, okay. So this is a mosque, um, and everybody is very welcome to visit the Berlin Mosque whenever they like. Um, and I just thought I don't know if you've heard the call to prayer. One gentleman actually had a recording of the uh, call to prayer from Morocco. Um, you have one too. Oh, cool. Okay. I thought I would pr uh, play you my call to prayer, which is. Um, I'll just make it up a little louder. I hope, I hope everybody can hear this. Maybe I should move the... Okay, let's try this out. Okay, so this is a dawn call to prayer. Okay, you probably have all heard the call to prayer. It's in many movies. Uh, one particular movie that I'd like to draw your attention to is The Return of the Pink Panther. <laughs> um, it's with Peter Sellers, and it has the... the it starts off with call to prayer, which is really amazing. Uh, but really what the person who's making the film is trying to say is that this is, a, you know, a, an Arab country, but we know, we know, it, you know it, it doesn't have to be an Arab country, it's 82% chance that it isn't, right? Um, but this, I just thought I would play this to you. This is actually a recording of the dawn called prayer, and I have to apologize for a few things. One is that there's a rooster <laughs> in this recording, which is a really annoying rooster. And the other thing is there are a few birds that, that are kind of um, making noise, but let me just try and um, play this again.
Okay, this song is only set at dawn, and here he's saying, prayer is better than sleep. Is everyone sleeping? Get out of bed right God is greater. There is no power saved from the one God. Okay, so that's the call to press. And next time you watch that movie, uh, Return to the Pink Panther, the Pink Panther, you'll have that extra new dimension of listening to the call to prayer. Um, yeah, so this is, so, yeah, so the, and it's always in Arabic. Um, you can actually Google Azan, which is call to prayer, and you will, you can find a call to prayer from Istanbul. You can find a call to prayer from Medina or Mecca or anywhere. And it will always be the same words, but it's very specific to the Muslim, the person who does the call to prayer. Okay. Um, and there, there are even like musical uh, in, sort of uh, pieces that are being written around the call to prayer, which is you know, a classical piece, which is very interesting. Um, so that's the call to prayer. And this guy here is the Muezzin. He's the one who calls the call to prayer. And um, this, actual, this actual picture was taken actually in, in China, which is very interesting. That's why I love this picture so much, it's because it was in, it's from China. All right. Um, this is actually, a, I thought I'd like share with you a few uh, different timetables. This is actually on the shortest uh, day of the year. If you look at the 21st, the dawn prayer is around 5.50. Uh, the noon time prayers are around noon still, uh, and the afternoon prayers around two, and then they have evening prayers at sunset around four, uh, four, four thirty-ish, and then the night prayer is at five. So it's a very squished day. So usually, you know, if you're in school, um, December can be tough in terms of fitting the prayers in. Okay, and so sometimes, you know, my, my son, when um, you know, when he was in high school, he actually uh, uh, sort of spoke to the librarian and said, "Can I pray in this?" very quiet and she was so happy to oblige and when I went to the open house she said come let me show you where you some praise which was really cool um, if you look at June on the other hand it's a much longer day but the challenges are different because uh, the first prayer is around 3 30 in the morning and the final prayer is after 10 so usually the issue is getting up in time or keeping up late enough in order to make the last prayer uh, people have asked me, do you go to bed after you pray the, the, the morning prayer? And I say, well, a lot of times I do, but the time I do, I'm so much more tired because REM sleep is affected. If I manage to keep up and have like a little siesta at lunchtime, that's the best. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that's, these are the challenges that we face um, in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, away from the equator. Okay, um, okay now another thing, um, I don't know if people were watching us praying, but I wanted you to be aware of you know, a few things. Uh, if you were to uh, sort of wonder if, if the person has started praying, usually you start, the person who starts praying will do this, um, which is your surrendering to God, okay? Um, and um, another thing, and, and it, it's, you know, sitting and uh, leaning and sort of kneeling, etc. Um, one thing to note that when someone is, is, is bowing like this, they're saying, that, they're saying their prayers and they're saying, glory be to God for the mag magnificent. And if ever you see somebody with their head to the ground, they're saying, glory be to God in the highest. Um, and if you think about it, when you actually carry it out, we're actually at our lowest point. So it's a beautiful thing to think about, that God is so um, high, we are so low compared to what God is. So it's a reminder for us um, when we pray, um, because we're carrying it out kind of thing. Okay? All right. Um, so that's the prayer. Uh, in terms of charity, we're supposed to give 2.5% of our income and wealth to the poor, that's the minimum. The word for charity is zakat, which means purification, or purifying your wealth when you give to the poor, okay? Uh, which is a great idea. Um, and it's, the minimum that it is 2.5%, of course the maximum is 100, uh, and it's up to you to decide what. But usually people will, will calculate annually 2.5% uh, of their wealth, um, if you if you live paycheck to paycheck, um, you don't have to pay the cap because you're you're using the money as you go along. But if you have uh, jewelry or if you have that extra home in the, in Barbados, um, then of course you have to pay on on your wealth. Okay. And the point of it is, it's, it's, it's different to tithing because tithing is usually to a specific institution. Uh, for the Muslim, it's the it's the responsibility of each Muslim to look around themselves to look at what is needed. 
Um, some people will give as a cat to a poor relative, others will give it to a tsunami uh, victim. Um, it's up to the individual to be aware of the need around them. Many will give to mercy shelter in Hartford, in, you know, where we are. Um, so it's up to the individual um, to know the needs that are around them. Uh, and as I said, you know, it's, it's, it's nice to think that you're purifying your wealth. I remember one time uh, counseling you know, a man who was terminal, and he said, you know, I have to pay my zakat because I'm, I mean, if I die before I pay my zakat, I'm, I'm, I'm stolen from the poor. So please make sure that I pay this money to this. Um, it's very important to many Muslims that that, that is done every year. Okay. Um, fasting in the month of Ramadan, uh, we fast at a specific time, the ninth lunar month of the year, uh, of the lunar year. At the moment, it's in June. Uh, we started our fat month of fasting on the 6th of June. The year before that, we started around the 16th of June. The year before that, we started around the 26th of June, so every day we lose 10 days. Okay, so it's like a starting basis. Um, and so the kids will be in school, and so there's a whole other challenge that is required um, for us. Um, so the reason why there's a new moon here is because we look for the new moon, and when we see the new moon, that means when it's around Jewish time, then it's time for the fast to begin. Okay? Uh, I love this picture because it's just so cute. Um, this is actually. Um, the first headscarf bearer of Sesame Street. And um, this is actually a, a little uh, picture that was, was sent to Muslims around the world to greet um, the, the, the sort of Ramadan. So it was, it was, I, I really like that. That's really cute. Uh, so I just thought I would add that to my presentation. Um, so when we fast, we, um, we don't eat or drink. We don't drink any water. Very similar to um, you know, when, when the Jewish congregation fasts as well in uh, Yom, Yom Kippur. Um, we also uh, have no marital relations from dawn till sunset, okay? We always eat at sunset, okay? And the reason I'm stressing that is one time my husband, I think he told a friend of his that uh, he was fasting for 30 days and on the second day, um, his friend said, you know, he looked really rough. And so my husband said, well, what did you eat last night? And he said, you're supposed to eat every night? And he said, uh-huh. Uh, he told me we're just going to fast for 30 days straight. Uh -huh. So that's why I'm really reinforcing the fact that we do break our fast every time that's on sex. Okay? So just to be that uh, aware of that. All right. This, I love this graphic because it just talks, it just shows how people are fasting around the world. Uh, those poor people in Reykjavik in Iceland, um, they actually fasted an average of 21 hours because they're so north, right? right. And those people in Buenos Aires, shame on them. I mean, this is like <laughs> nine hours, right? Uh, we had around 15 hours. But it just shows uh, the difference in terms of uh, the times that people are fasting. But in 15 years' time, it'll be the other way around. Okay, because, you know, sort of when it's in December, we'll be fasting for much shorter. So, you know, we get, we get, uh, we get it all evens out in the end. Over a period of 31 years, so. but it does even out. <laughs> okay, excellent, which is my next slide. Okay, so the point of fasting is, it's to build willpower, it's power, it's to, it's to teach us self-restraint, okay? I know when my, my son started fasting, he was five years old. Of course, he didn't have to fast because we don't, uh, you know, young kids don't have to fast, they usually, uh, it becomes important around puberty time, so similar to bar mitzvah time, um, when things get serious. Before then, of course, it's up, you know, it's then not responsible. Uh, and so my son started fasting when he was five, uh, and I remember going to the teacher and saying that he doesn't have to fast. And I used to provide a, a packed lunch for him, and it would come home, it would come back unopened every day. And that was the year that my son beat me. He actually fasted more days than I did because I had the flu and, you know, for a short while. And he was so proud of himself that he beat mom, you know? Um, so uh, it was, it, you know, so there are certain times when people don't fast uh, or don't have to fast. If they're, if they're sick, if they're old, if they're very young, if they're traveling, if they're pregnant, if they're um, breastfeeding, um, all those people don't have to fast. Um, if, if, if you're a diabetic, for instance, it's gonna, it's gonna really um, you know, play with your, your sugar levels. So all those people are sort of counseled usually not to fast because God doesn't want us to suffer. He wants us to get a, a you know, sort of work on our relationship with him. And if we're sick or not well, you know, so if, we're, if we're unwell, it's not gonna help that. So he wants us, if we're healthy, to be able to fast, okay? Um, 
To a certain extent, we feel compassion for those who are hungry, but it's nothing like how people who are really hungry will feel, because at least we have, we have that knowledge that we'll have a meal at the end of the day. Uh, a lot of people won't have that, and so when our stomachs start rumbling, uh, we are reminded that there are poor who are starving, but nothing close, really. Um, it's time when we reflect on ourselves, on our purpose in life. You know, are we doing what God really intended us to do? Are we doing the right, you know, the best that we can do? Uh, and it's also time when we uh, sort of uh, strengthen community relations. Uh, we break fast together, we pray together. There's an extra prayer that we do at night, after the nighttime prayer, uh, which actually extends, you know, usually this is the summer, we pray until around 12 midnight and then go home. And I have to say, the most challenging thing isn't the food, it's really the sleep. Because we start our fast so early in the day, and you know, sort of, we start at 3 30, so if you're cooking a meal, you get up at 2 in the morning uh, to prepare the meal for the family so they'll have a small meal before. Uh, and so the, the issue is really sleep for a lot of people, especially if you have, if you have a 9 to 5 job, uh, it's very challenging. Okay, so at the end of Ramadan, after the 30 years after we see the new moon again, that means it's the end of the month of Ramadan and we have a big celebration. This says Eid Mubarak, which means have a happy celebration. Uh, originally when these, these stacks were designed, it was, in, it was in 2001, when Ramadan was actually in December. And it came out with all the stacks. It came out with the Kwanzaa and the Hanukkah and the Nativity scene. And it still does. You know, it, it, still, it still comes out in December. So in December we kind of uh, stock up and uh, use it. Uh, I remember one time a friend of mine said that she was in the, in the post office and there was a lady in front of her who wanted Christmas stamps. And um, so in December, so she, you know, she, the, 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 post, the post office guy gave him, you know, the usual ticket to see and she said, no, no, I want the one with the golden Christmas tree. <laughs> Happy celebration. That's it, really. Okay. And nowadays we have this one, and I, I showed this last time I gave a talk, and, and someone says, that looks just like a sleigh. You know, it's a, we can't win, we can't win. <laughs> okay, so at the end of, uh, of the month of Ramadan, we have a big festival. Um, people are asking, what does it feel like? It's like having you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas on the same day kind of thing, because we're <laughs> thankful to God, and it's also a time when we have gift giving. So it's a very you know, sort of um, a lot of celebration. Uh, we wake up early, we have showers, we usually have new clothes or, or good clothes that we wear and go to the mosque every morning, I mean on uh, that morning. And then we have started a new tradition, and that is we go to IHOP. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really interesting when you when you go to IHOP and, and all these people, the regulars are like, why why are these Muslims here? It's a Wednesday morning, you know what? But so it's very interesting to see that reaction as well. But it's also interesting to try and have breakfast at nine in the morning when you're used to fasting. Um, and you have to see all those pancakes, it's amazing. Uh, so it's really uh, uh, an incredible um, uh, experience that I have on the first day of the next month of Ramadan. <laughs> all right. Um, so I thought, thought I'd talk a little bit about dietary restrictions. Um, as Muslims, we are not allowed to eat pork. Ham, lard, uh, and I said no products from a pig because I, I one time told a friend I don't eat pork. And she said, I'll make you a salmon. And so she made a beautiful salmon, but she decorated it with pieces of ham <laughs> on the top. And so, of course, I could, and it all infused in, so I couldn't, I couldn't have it. And then, so she felt really bad. So that's why I, I told everybody nothing from a pig. And there are lots of products from pigs, right? So there you have gelatin and you have. Um, uh, all kinds of things. So you know, we, we usually stay away from those things uh, because we're told to. Uh, and it says here, uh, shellfish for some Muslims. Uh, we don't uh, drink any alcohol as well. But I have to say, there are 1.7 billion of us, and we are not monolithic. Okay. So the Quran tells us you you know you should stay away from pork. Uh, that it's not it's not allowed for you to eat any pork. And so the, and and the, when we have and when we have meat. It has to be prepared in a certain way. Okay, very similar concept to kosher. Okay, uh, and many Muslims will say, you know, we will eat meat so long as it's prepared in that way. And the word is zabiha halal. Okay, so many Muslims will have the only zabiha halal meat. Okay, so it has to be prepared by an imam. Okay, um, there are other Muslims, and I'm one of those who will also, as well as zabiha halal, will also have kosher because it's the same, the same process. 
So I would eat kosher meat and I would eat halal meat. There are other Muslims who will say, I'm not going to eat pork, but I can have a beef sandwich and I'll just say the name of God before I, I eat it. So they'll say in the name of the one God, the most gracious, the most merciful, and then they'll, they'll have a beef sandwich. Okay? And then there are others who will say, I don't really care, it's not my major focus in my faith. Um, and they'll have a, they may have a ham sandwich, you know? So there's a whole gamut in terms of how, I mean, in terms, in terms of diversity, in terms of how we practice our faith. Um, it doesn't make you not a Muslim if you have, you know, if you, if you, if you break the rules. It just means that you're breaking the rules. Because um, some people will say, you know, he can't be a Muslim because he drinks alcohol. But there are some people, I mean, we're all human beings. There are some Muslims who may drink alcohol. They're not supposed to, but they may do. And so um, 1.7 billion of us are not monolithic. So just something to, to remember that. Um, OK, so let's go to the next slide. The final. Uh, practice, uh, worship practice is that of Hajj. And the reason why we're so excited at this time is because this is the month of Hajj. We just started it this um, Saturday, uh, the 10th month, so in about seven days, we're going to, on the 12th of um, September, we're going to be having our big festival, another festival. But, so we have two festivals, one at the end of Ramadan and one on the 10th day of Hajj. And you'll see it on your, on your, on your schedule. The day before that is called Arafah, where um, a lot of Muslims will fast if they don't go on the pilgrimage. Uh, and if they do go on the pilgrimage, it's the day when they actually will gather in a place, the Mount of Arafah, and rehearse the Day of Judgment. Uh, when I was uh, lucky enough to go um, to for Hajj uh, in 2006, um, I can remember being on that mountain and looking around me and seeing everybody with tears coming down their eyes, asking God for forgiveness. It's a beautiful, uh, very, very uh, emotional uh, place to be, and it's a life-changing um, experience. It was for me, anyway. Um, so at the moment, around, I mean, when I went, five million people were at this place. Um, if you think about the population of Connecticut, we're three million, right? So if you imagine everybody in Connecticut and then some are in one place, um, it's pretty intense. Um, and just the thought that everybody is there for that sole purpose of worshiping God um, is exceedingly intense. Okay. Okay, so all those dots you can see are all people. And this cube is called the Kaaba. Uh, I mean, the believe that it was built by Abraham, originally built by Adam, but built by Abraham and his son. And everything about the Hajj is about Abraham and his family. Um, so we remember Abraham intensely. Um, during during the during the pilgrimage, uh, I think I said all about that. So I'll just go to the next slide. Okay, so this is a picture of this is my husband and my daughter and my son, and they're dressed in um, the the garb of of the pilgrimage, which is two towels. Um, my husband is actually telling my kids, "Don't get lost." Okay, <laughs> and this is actually at a different time. It's not at the Hajj time because there's five million people. So we took them. At a, at a quieter time. So this is uh, in 2008. We, just, we probably show them the different sites because it's their responsibility when they're adults to go for the hatch. So you know, they, they'll do that, but we thought we'd just show them the sites. And of course, on the 10th uh, day of Dhul uh, Hijjah, which is on the 12th of September this year, we have another big celebration. Again, we go to the mosque, we go to IHOP, the same, you know, same things happen again. <laughs> Now, I'm wondering, can anybody read the Arabic? <laughs> you know, I've spoken to you for, I think, less than two hours, and you guys have already speak Arabic. You read Arabic. That's a really great presenter, right? Uh, yes, it is. So this is actually the basket of Robin, um, in Mecca. And my son has a huge grin in it on his face because he's just had a huge tub of chocolate ice cream. And um, nobody usually gets to see these photographs, so um, I thought I would share that with you. So this is. And when you read it, it's, I did my, my kids when they were re learning to read Arabic, you can see them, they were starting out in Bas, in, oh, that's in Roberts, okay. <laughs> so that's basically how, how, how it's done. I thought I would, this is my final few slides, I, I would focus, I, I read on the, on the explanation for my talk that I was supposed to speak about women as well. So I added my slides from women as well, I have another whole presentation on that. But I just thought I would quickly talk about uh, women in terms of our four greatest women. Number one woman is Maryam, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon her. There's uh, a whole chapter in the Quran, the 19th chapter in the Quran is called Maryam. 
after Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, and, there's an, and in the Quran, it talks about Maryam or Mary as the woman, the, the person chosen by God to have Jesus. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on how devout she was. Um, there's a beautiful story about how Zechariah was looking after Maryam uh, when she was younger and how he would look in on her and uh, it would be winter and she would have summer fruits and, she, and, and, she, and he would ask her, where did you get these fruits from? And she would tell him, God provides. Uh, at which point he um, prayed and said, give me a son and he was given uh, John the Baptist um, as a son. Uh, so that whole story is in the Quran. Um, the second woman uh, is Asya, and she was actually married to uh, the Pharaoh at the time of Moses sitting on her. And the reason why she's so important is because she kept her faith. She was um, she believed in the one God. She was married to this guy who thought he was God and gave her a hard time about it. Um, and actually killed her because she refused to bow down to him. Uh, and she said, no, I believe in the creator of, of, of the world. And um, so there's a, there's, you know, she, she's the person who actually helped bring up Moses. So this person, uh, Maryam helped bring up Mary, and Asya helped bring up Moses. And then the final two are Khadija, the wife of the prophet, peace be upon him, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and Fatima, the daughter of the prophet. And the reason why they are all four of them are so important is because of that devoutness to the one, the one God. Okay? Um, there's another woman that we actually celebrate, and that's Hajra, Haya. Okay, uh, we actually, when we go for the Hajj, we actually walk in the footsteps of, of Abraham, and every single pilgrim will walk in the footsteps of Haya. The story goes um, when Abraham took Haya away. You know, so, so what happened was, so Abraham was married to Sarah. Okay. They couldn't have children, and so Sarah gave her maid servant, Keda or Hajra, to Abraham to be a wife. And so uh, the, the product of, of, of that union was Ismail or Ishmael, okay? And at a certain point in time, uh, uh, Abraham took Keda away and left her in the valley of Mecca, now known as Mecca, okay? Um, and the story goes that, I mean, it's very interesting in, in the Quran, it says that Hagar, I don't know as a wife how I would you know, think of my husband, when, what I would think of my husband, he was to leave me in a, in a barren land with, with no water, etc. I'm like, I might be a tad upset about it. Um, she asked Abraham, she said, is this what God has commanded? And he said, yes. And she said, in that case, I'm fine. And that just shows her immense faith in God. Uh, if God has, uh, has said this, then I'll, I'll be fine. Uh, and he leaves her with this baby, uh, Ishmael, or Ismail, and uh, with a little bit of water and a little bit of dates, okay? And he goes, he leaves her, and she basically is there. Um, you know, so, so she finishes the water that she has, she finishes the dates, and then the baby starts crying. So she runs up this little hill, and she looks out to see if there's anybody there. Of course, there's nobody there. So she walk, runs back and she looks out of this other hill. And then she runs back. She, she runs seven times back and forth. And when we go for the pilgrimage, we do the same thing. Actually, I don't run. I, I kind of walk fast. <laughs> but but the, the, the tradition is to, to run between these two small hills. And, and we do so. And at the seventh run, uh, the baby stops crying. She thinks, oh my God, Ishmael has died. And she looks at him, and there's this, he, there's this, this fountain of water coming from where his, his heel is. And the story goes that people believe that Angel Gabriel touches this, this spot of land with his wing, and water comes forth. And to this day, pilgrims will run between these two mount, uh, little mountains and drink from the well of Zephyr. Mm. Um, and we do this, um, every pilgrim will do this, uh, men and women walk in the footsteps of this woman here. So this is a picture of uh, the Kaaba, and all these uh, people are, are um, this is actually Safa, which is um, one of the hills, and Mara, which, and, and this is, uh, they're walking back and forth between these two, this is Mara and this is Safa, the two hills that Hagar uh, ran between. And then at the end of running seven times, we drink from the well of Sansa. And the point of this is to teach us that 
if that is effort, and you really, you sort of, if you really put effort into what you do, you will be rewarded. So that's the message from it. So she ran seven times. I mean, God could have given her the reward on the first run, but because of that effort. So it's kind of a message for us in terms of effort. Okay. Um, and in terms of women, um, usually, I mean, it's very Arabic is similar to Spanish in that if it's masculine and plural, it includes women as well. Okay, so if you have the masculine plural word, it includes men and women. Uh, but there are actually some verses in the Quran that talks about that, that, that actually includes the feminine plural as well. To, to tell us that women are very, very important. And they're included in the masculine plural, but they're, they're actually included also in the feminine plural. And this is one such verse. It says, the believers, men and women, are protectors one of another. They enjoy what is just and forbid what is evil. They observe regular prayers, practice regular charity, and obey God and his messenger. On them will God pour forth his mercy, for God is exalted in power wise. So it talks about women specifically. Okay? Um, and this one, this is, this is a, uh, you know, an example of that. It says, indeed, the Muslim men and Muslim women, the believing men and believing women, the obedient men and obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the charitable men and the charitable women, um, the fasting men and the fasting women, the men who love their chastity and the women who do so, and the men who remember God often and the women who do so. For them, God has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. So uh, the monopoly, you know, men do not have a monopoly on faith. Um, women are very important and equal to men in terms of um, how, how God sees us. Um, and, and that's a and as an example, I just thought we are going to talk about uh, in terms of our roles because that was one of the, the, the titles. So um, the role of the, the man uh, is usually to provide, um, and so a lot of the times young men will go and they'll work, and and that, their responsibility is to pay for their families. For a woman, she can work, but her money is entirely her own. If she gives it to her family, it's seen as a charity. Um, so as a result of that, it's very interesting. The first ever, it says here, um, the, the oldest degree granting university in the world, according to the Guinness Book of Records, was actually in Fez. And the money that was, um, you know, so that paid for this college was actually from women because they had, they could inherit money. Uh, and they were the ones, they didn't have to spend it on their family, they could spend it on whatever they wanted. And uh, this is an example of that. Fatma al she actually paid for this university because she could inherit. And, you know, and this was done, I mean, this was in 859 Common Era. So way before, you know, women were really inheriting in, you know, in, in countries in the West. Um, so it's really an eye-opener uh, in terms of, of um, sort of uh, what women were able to do. Uh, I thought I would end, this is my final slide, I think. So I thought I would end by talking about mothers, because I am a mother. Um, and it says here, it's initially and usually the mother's role to instill in her child a sincere love of God. There are two traditions. One tradition, you know, the prophet was asked, who should you show kindness to the most? And the man, and, and the prophet said, to your mother. And after that, who? And he said, to your mother. <laughs> and after that, who? And he said, to your mother, three times. And after that, he said, then to your father. So we at home have this, I, I don't know if he, he agrees with me, but we have this uh, you know, idea that I only really deserve three quarters of the love. <laughs> mother, 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 father. Um, and then there's this, this other tradition that says paradise lies under the feet of the mother. So there's a lot of um, respect for motherhood because it's our job to instill in our kids a love of God, which is very challenging, right? Because, you know, sort of, a lot of people have that challenge. How do we instill in our kids a, 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 a reverence and a love of God. And with that, I'll, I'll show you a picture of my kids. This is Yusuf, okay? Um, and that's Yasmin. And of course, they don't look like that now because one is 18 and one is 21. <laughs> but of course, this is when they look really cute, so I didn't want to take this slide out. And every time I show this, this, this picture to people, my, my son says, he didn't show that picture of us 100 million years ago. Did you know? <laughs> um, and I thought I would you know, show you this picture as well. This is the picture of my son Yusuf. 
um, when he was the first time. So usually, you know, after we pray, we have like a supplication prayer. Where my my husband will have a list of things he's grateful for, and then it will be my turn. Then my daughter will go, and this is the first time my son ever did a supplication to God. So that's why I took the photograph. Uh, and he's saying, "Yeah, Allah, oh God, thank you for my family." Uh, thank you for the shelter that we have. Thank you for my big sister. And of course, he's saying that because we told him to say that. <laughs> but he's saying, but most of all, thank you for my Lion King toys. I love you very, very much. So this, this picture does help, you know, to, to sort of ground me, I have to say. And you know this is a legitimate picture because you can see Elmo in the background. Can you see Elmo there? No, this is a very legit picture. Um, in terms of references, that we, uh, you know, come to the end. So in terms of references, um, this is a... A great reference is called the Muslim Next Door. I love it because it, it says uh, it's about the Quran, the media, and that veil thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, next one. This is also a great reference, also by a woman uh, who speaks for Islam uh, by Dalia Mokahed, and she talks about a lot about Islam and a lot about what a billion Muslims actually think, uh, which is a big, which is so great. And I, sh- I would go amiss if I didn't mention my husband's book. <laughs> so this is my husband's book. Uh, because he's in the audience, I thought that was the truth. But anyway, um, this is uh, it's a great, it, it talks about our experience um, as a Muslim American family. Uh, and it also has a great a section on, on Sharia and Jihad. And I think Rufai next week and the week after as well, we'll cover those two subjects because that's something that a good year is, is a burning issue. Um, so really, it's important to know, um, you know, take time to know your friends and your neighbors and etc. who are you know, sort of outside your, your real comfort zone. I know a lot of people, you know, feel a little bit inhibited, you know, to talk to a Muslim uh, because they have all those perceptions. But now you know me, uh, you know, sort of, sort of uh, meet people and, and don't, don't be too nervous to do so. Uh, if ever you want to visit our mosque, you're very, very welcome. Uh, there are a number of mosques in, in, in the area and we'll, you know, sort of try and uh, hook you up to those if, if you'd like. Um, it's, it's always important. I mean, it's very important to get to know your neighbors. Um, and uh, I think for me, it's you know, you know, when I get to know people, it's an eye opening thing for me. So I think it's a win win on both sides. Um, I thought I would finally talk a little bit about modesty because this is one of the reasons why we wear our headscarf. Okay? Um, in terms of the women, it says here, and say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty and ornaments except what ordinarily appear thereon, that they should draw their veils over their chest area. Uh, and, and, and another verse says, O prophet, tell your wives and daughters and the believing women that they should cast uh, their outer garments over their bodies when abroad, so that they should be known and not molested. So people will read these verses and they, and they come to different conclusions. Um, some people will wear the heads up. Many scholars will say that they, you know, Muslim women should wear the headscarf. The majority of women may not wear the headscarf, but they, they certainly do when they pray. Um, my mother is an example of somebody who does that. And I have to say that she is a much better Muslim than I am. Uh, she doesn't wear the headscarf when she's abroad. She, she you know, we read that verse and said, oh, it means I should be modest. And so she's modest in, in, in the way that she interprets the verse. And I think it's important that everybody who, you know, sort of uh, makes their own decisions in terms of whether they should wear a headscarf or not. Because when it, when, it is your own, it, it, when it is your own decision, it is an act of faith. And that's why I have an issue with, you know, Saudi Arabia maybe for, for enforcing the headscarf and France for banning it. Okay, they both are, I, I would say they're both wrong. Because it takes the power away from the woman to make that decision. Um, People ask me, well, what about the men? You know, this is all about women, right? I have to say that the verse before this is about men. And I'll just give you a brief, this is my final story, I promise. Um, one of my friends, she went, uh, she was visiting uh, an Arab country, I think the United Arab Emirates, and she went to a marketplace. And at the marketplace, um, she saw these oranges, and she picked up an orange, and she was about to ask the seller, how much is this? Now this woman uh, is, is um, you know, from Canada. Um, she's very well versed in Arabic. She knows Sakharan very well. She dresses like me. Um, she wears a headscarf. But it just so happened that this one second when she asked the guy how much the orange was, it so happened that there was one little strand of hair that was coming out of her headscarf. 
And the, the orange fellow saw this and he, she, he said, he pointed to her and said, you are going to hell. Oh, okay. Oh. And I have to say, if, uh, if that had happened to me, I probably would say, okay, thank you very much, goodbye, and left. But because she was educated and because she knew the scripture very well, she recited this following verse, and I'll just share it with you. This is what she said to him in Arabic, okay? And this is from this is a direct quote from the Quran. It says, Say to the believing men that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty. That will make for greater purity for them. And God is well acquainted with all that they do. <laughs> so he should be looking at them. <laughs> So this is something to, so I mean, you know, we need to have education, we need, and that's the reason why education is so vital, so we can, we can use it as a shield and protect us, as the Hadith previously said, you know, why is education so important? This is, this is one of the reasons why. So on that note, I think it's, this is my Q&A slide, uh, if anybody would like to ask any questions, I will try my best to ask, I don't know how much time I can I should talk, I apologize, um, but if I've gone over, I really apologize. Okay, we have a few minutes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce a moderator for this brief Q&A, um, with much thanks <coughs> to our Adult Education Committee, our Social Action Committee, also our Bagels and Books group, um, who are all taking part in sponsoring this. Ellen Nolman is our chair of our Adult Education Committee, and she will be um, calling on you and uh, moderating for about 15 minutes. And then again, I do hope you'll save for, for a little bite to eat. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Irene. Um, I'm sure that there are questions, so yes. Yeah. What is it actually that Ramadan celebrates? Is it an event in the history of the people? Uh, what is this? Okay, excellent question. Did anybody hear the question? It means what does Ramadan signify? Okay, so the month of Ramadan, it's actually the month of revelation. Uh, we believe that the Torah was revealed during the month of Ramadan. That the gospel, the gospel that was sent to Jesus, we believe that Jesus received the gospel, and that was during the month of Ramadan. And the Quran was also revealed during the month of Ramadan. So we're, we're grateful for the revelation. Uh, because this is our connection with our Creator. Our, our scripture is our connection with our Creator, so we're grateful for that. So that's the significance of Ramadan. Um, but in terms of the fast, also we see it in terms of um, that it's, it's uh, in, you know, every, every, every uh, all the people of the book did fast, and so we're keeping that tradition as well. But the significance of Ramadan specifically is it's a month of revelation. So in order to be a, a Muslim, uh, so, uh, we have to believe in God, um, and we, uh, so there's the, the Shahada that I mentioned, um, we believe in God, and we believe in the scriptures as they were given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, so that's how you are a Muslim, specifically. But we know, we know from the de definition of the word Muslim that it's someone who believes in God in order to obtain peace. So it depends how you want to define what Muslim is. Um, but in terms of the other, so you, you asked about the different, uh, the different groups, and I think uh, Imam Rafai will cover that next week. But just very briefly, the difference, <laughs> the very, very briefly, the difference is in terms of politics, in terms of when the Prophet died, um, there are some in the group who believed that the Prophet um, designated his best friend, Abu Bakr, to be. And that came from you know a, a, a few days before when he actually asked Abu Bakr to lead the prayer. So a lot of people said this was a sign that he was kind of uh, you know sort of giving over the mantle to Abu Bakr. Another group um, you know saw you sort of um, thought that Ali should get the the leadership uh, because he was related to the Prophet. 
Uh, and um, so, so it's so um, the Sunni, which are 85 percent um, of those who you know, see Abu Bakr as the first caliph, and the Shia, which is 15 percent uh, of the population, saw um, Ali as being the first caliph. That being said, the first, uh, if you are a Sunni, um, the fourth caliph is Ali. Okay, so it's really a political difference. All Muslims, whether they're Shia or they're Sunni, uh, will believe in one God, will fast, will pray five times a day, will, um, uh, or they, they may combine their prayers depending on how uh, people interpret the scripture. Uh, they all go for Hajj, they all fast, um, they all carry out the five pillars. Sorry? So you can be a Sunni Muslim or a Shia Muslim, or you know there are there are different groups. So, but the point is that we all have the same worship practices and beliefs, um, and the difference is a political difference. Um, and so and, it's, and when people ask me, you know, are you are you a Sunni or a Shia? I say I'm a Muslim because for me in, in the United States it doesn't matter. Um, we you know we have the same beliefs, etc. It does matter, however, in places where there's uh, an issue about the control of water or land. So for instance, in Iraq at the moment, um, Saddam Hussein was a Sunni in charge of a Shia majority country. And so when we went into Iraq um, and toppled Saddam Hussein, the Shia took control. And so the, Muslim, the Sunni in that group is in the country uh, rebelled against. And that's why we have ISIS today. ISIS were those who were uh, in Saddam Hussein's party. Uh, and, and so that's so it's a political issue um, more than anything. Um, and, and so that's why for me as an um, American Muslim, those, those different groups, it doesn't really matter to me. Um, but it matters when you are you know, a minority and you cannot get any rights because you're from a certain group. Um, and that's the issue. Um, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, sometimes you, like, you are traveling okay, very good. Okay. you are at a place you cannot have a private home. Right. Okay, so that's a very good question. Uh, so uh, the question was, what, what can you do if you don't, if you cannot have, uh, if you don't have time to pray or you're, you just cannot pray? Uh, and I would use the example of the new research. Okay? So he's in his operating theater, he's got an eight hour surgery. And this, hour, you know, this, this little bit of opportunity is going to go, right? But as Muslims, the number one most important thing is the preservation of life. Okay? So that's, that, that trumps everything. Sorry for the word trump. But that that, 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 that uh, sort of uh, trumps everything. Sorry. And so, you know, usually what uh, you know, a neurosurgeon would do is, if he wanted to pray, he would make it up afterwards. So there is a window of opportunity, but you have to do it for the right reasons. If, if your intention is, I'm going to miss my prayer, that's not good. But if your intention is to pray and for some reason you cannot do it, then you know God is all merciful and your intention was correct. You couldn't do it. You can make it up later. Okay. So if you just pray in the morning and then at night and you do then an extra prayer to make it up, is that you can make it up? But but the, but the intention isn't that you don't pray. And make it up. The intention that you do, but, ah, I couldn't do it because I was saving your life or something. Uh, and then, so a lot of a lot is is in your intention. Um, and so, you know, of course, preservation of life is number one. Ask God specifically. There's no intermediaries at all. Um, and we're told in the Quran, you know, the, the Quran is a recitation. It, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's from God. And when God refers to himself as I or we in his royal we. Um, and, and God tells us that he's closer to us than our jugular vein. And he hears the prayer of every person who, who calls out to him. Um, so we're, we're reminded of God's closeness to us, uh, and of God's mercy, and of God's love, of course. Thank you for that question. Yeah. So, uh, you showed the gentleman on the screen that doing the call to prayer. Is there something in your community that does that, or do you guys just send your phone for a <laughs> 
Okay, so that's a very good question. So the question is, when do you know when to give up uh, or less? As, you know, so if you go to certain countries, you, you'll hear the call to prayer quite right. Um, the mosques themselves, they'll, they'll have a call to prayer, but it's using a microphone and it's inside the mosque. So we, I don't think we need a permit, I think, to, to be able to talk about that. Um, so a lot of people will have uh, apps um, that will even play the call to prayer, but I have actually a, an alarm clock that will, pray, uh, that will play the call to prayer uh, out loud. Um, so usually, I mean, so we will use one of those, those methods to do so. Um, and in terms of the call to prayer, we usually have is we pick someone in the mosque, for instance, we'll pick somebody who has a good voice who can really project. Um, and of course, pitch is all, always very important. If someone has no pitch, it's really bad. So we usually get somebody who's, you know, on key, you know, sort of m melodious. My husband actually, he was uh, once, he, he did the call to prayer. And there was somebody from the Harper Court and uh, who went up to him and said, you know, are, are you a tenor? Yeah. And, and he, he had never considered himself as, you know, a tenor or a bass. Uh, so it was very interesting how they made that connection. Uh, but usually, and, and at home, you know, sometimes my daughter will do the call to prayer, sometimes my son will do the call to prayer. Um, you know, if it's, if it's at home, you know, sort of, uh, you know, anybody can do the call to prayer, really. Um, so long as it's nice. <laughs> yes. people who are African-American, we have people who are Bosnian. I think there is actually is a Bosnian mosque, it's just specifically Bosnian because that sermon is, it, sermon is in Bosnian. But apart from that mosque, the majority of mosques are relatively, you know, very diverse. Um, you know, the Imam may, may be, you know, he, he could be from any country. So depending, I mean, so it's really very diverse, the ones that I know of. Um, there can be a majority of a certain ethnicity, but generally speaking, um, everybody is welcome everywhere. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I thank you so much for your presentation. I really enjoy listening to you. Um, you know, I've been thinking about the uh, issue of revelation, and I do think that the uh, Muslim perspective on the Torah and the Gospels is a little more complicated than you suggested in your talk. Mm -hmm. That is, you feel that the Quran is privileged in a way uh, versus the Jews feeling the Torah is privileged, the Christians feeling the Gospels are privileged. So everybody feels their stuff is privileged. And I just wondered what your thinking was right. about that question. That's a very interesting question. Okay, so in terms of revelation, how do we look on our revelation? Um, I have to say that when you read um, sections of the Torah, or when you read sections of the Bible, or when you read sections of the Quran, you're reminded that, you know, this is the same source. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's this sort of a, a a sort of a focus on love of God. There's a focus on doing good to your neighbors. Uh, and so that is something that is throughout, uh, in terms of when you look at the Torah, and when you look at the Injil or the Gospel, or you look at the Quran. So you know that the source is the same. Um, Muslims will say, um, you know, when you look at the Quran, that it hasn't been changed, that it's as it was in its it's kind of, if you change the word in the Quran, that if we change one letter of the Quran, that's going to be, you know, we're going to be in trouble. Um, and so Muslims will say, well, this is, this has not been changed by human beings. Um, 
we don't we don't have the the gospel as it was revealed to um, Jesus. But there are like you know, when you read the when you read the gospel, the, the New Testament, you can see the similarities in terms of how God is referred to and how um, his creation is referred to, etc. etc. So there is the commonalities. So as Muslims we say, well, this is confirming previous revelation. And in terms of where we differ, then that's another matter. Um, and then there are different, different, different ways that we do differ in terms of looking at Jesus, for instance. And we don't see him as divine, we see him as a prophet of God. So that's one specific distinction that we would you know, sort of um, disagree with people who are Christian who believe that Jesus is divine. Um, so there are things like that, and then you know, and we're told in the Quran that you know people are you know, have different uh, ways and beliefs, and God will decide at the end of the day who is right, and who is wrong, and how wrong we are, and how right we are. So you know, focus on your faith, and then God will make the decision in the end. Um, so that's 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 the uh, the you know, sort of advice that God gives us when it, it, it looks at various uh, other religions, etc. And, and, and God also says in the Quran that if he had wanted us to be one faith, he could have done that easily. But he wants us to, to kind of search, and he wants us to you know, sort of uh, think and reflect on you know, what we're doing and what our purpose is, etc. and on our connection with our Creator. So he wants that reflection, he wants that to be a choice maybe in terms of, you know, so that we, we do get to see these different um, ways of practice of belief in one God. Um, so we can get, we can come to our own conclusions. So there's a lot of emphasis on, on the fact that we should reflect. Um, and so that's, that's how I see you know, the different faiths in terms of how they relate to one another. Does that ask your question? Ish? <laughs> Yeah, so in terms of questioning, I mean, we wouldn't question God. We would question how we would interpret God's word. Um, so there are many people, there, there are many translations of the Quran. So as, as a Muslim who speaks only English, I'm afraid, um, I have to, I rely on an English translation. And a lot is lost in translation. Um, the, the Arabic language is very rich. I mean, it, it's very similar to Hebrew in its richness. And usually a one word in Arabic will not suffice, I mean in English, will not suffice for the, the, tr the translation. Um, and so someone, has told, someone told me that we would have to read at least seven English translations in order to get a gist of what God is trying to tell us. Um, so we, have, we do have a lot of uh, study groups uh, where we will we'll talk about, you know, sort of interpretations. Um, but we wouldn't say, we wouldn't question God specifically. We would say, this is God, God's word, how would we interpret it? Um, so it's a, a kind of a different kind of um, focus, um, I think. Um, but yeah. I think we have one more question. Yeah. Um, Muslims allowed to enter a mosque? And uh, because they didn't think that was true in other countries. Yeah. And do women and men pray together or separately? Good question. So the question was, do um, Muslims enter all mosques? Not Muslims at all. Okay, so I have to say that it's um, if you come to Berlin, of course you're very welcome. I remember going um, to Morocco, and the non-Muslims who were with us weren't allowed to go in, and I couldn't understand that because um, you know the whole earth is a place of prayer, um, and I, 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 I don't know about the motivations in terms of the, you know politically why why they chose not to allow non-Muslims to go in. Um, but uh, in terms of a sacred space, it, it's, uh, you know, like I, I know we've been invited to visit the Mormon temple. There's a Mormon temple that's being built 
in Farmington, and there's going to be, um, you know, so they're inviting everyone to come and see it before they, they close the doors. Uh, and we don't have a similar thing like that. We, you know, our, our doors are always open to everybody. Um, and we would encourage people to come and see us. Um, there, there may be some who don't allow people to come in. Maybe they're, they're nervous about political issues. I don't know. But generally speaking, um, you know, non-Muslims should, should be welcome. Um, if they're not, they should be. Um, but yeah, I know in, in Morocco, that was one of the things that we came across. Uh, oh, women and women. So in terms of women and men, um, we usually are segregated, and there's a reason for that. Um, the reason is when we pray, we pray shoulder to shoulder, very close together. And I have to say, um, if I'm praying next to a gentleman, I will be somewhat distracted. Um, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I, you know, I won't be able to focus on my prayer. Um, and so that's the, the major issue uh, is to be able to focus on our prayer. Okay. So we stand very close together, shoulder to shoulder. Part of our prayer is kneeling and bowing down. And I have to say, if there's a man standing behind me, again, I wouldn't be able to focus. Um, so it's in terms of practicality, in terms of modesty and preserving my own modesty, um, you know, a, a lot of Muslim women will say, um, you know, we, we, we can focus this way um, when we are segregated. Um, there are some feminists who say, you know, why should women be at the back, etc., etc. Uh, and I remember one time uh, a, a scholar um, she, she said, the most um, the, the most important place, the most sacred place that you could be, is where you are. Um, and so whether you're in the back or the front, etc., etc., it, 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 it doesn't matter because it's where you are. Um, and I have to say for myself, when I go to a mosque and I can, I can really focus on my prayer, uh, if there's no profound men standing behind me, I have to say. So that's the, I mean, the major issue, the focus is that you can focus on your prayer, and that's why there's a segregation. The only place where we are not segregated um, is in actually in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, because there are five million people that are all doing their own thing, and so that it's not practical to segregate men and women. But then people are there really, you know, sort of, to focus on, on the pilgrimage, so that's another focus. Um, and even when that does happen, I have to say, you know, I'll be standing there, and then a woman will be standing next to me, and then my husband will be standing next to me, and then another guy will be standing next to him. So it's somehow it works out, uh, and you can focus on your prayer. Um, but that's the major reason is that we can focus on our prayer. Thank you very much. Uh, this evening, we have some refreshments for everybody in the social hall, and we also have a table where we will be selling copies of uh, City Time. Uh, on tour. He is not only here waiting us to uh, autograph a few, but we'll be, we'll be back and probably autograph when we go to the game. So please join us. And if anybody would like to visit a mosque, please give me a call or email me, uh, and I'd love to take you around if that's possible. So please feel free to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Probably not, the week after, yes. Okay. Good to see you. Yeah, I'm thirsty. I'm not going to